Great. Hello, everyone. Hi. I'm just admitting everyone um, slowly. So if you want to welcome, um, tell us where you're calling in from in the chat. Let us know what company you work for. That would be great. And we're going to kick off in about uh, 30 seconds or so. So yeah, do do introduce yourself in the chat. Amazing. And thank you all for, for joining us for this session. I don't know if you've been on the other sessions today. It's been a really exciting and, and busy day and we've heard from lots of different B Corps across the community. And so um, this session that we're, we're digging into now is an update from the UK Climate Collective. And we're really excited to be hearing from lots of our um, Climate Collective working groups in, in this session as well, as well as a bit of an update on our COP26 plans. And this session is also being recorded as well. So great, amazing. Um, if we could go on to the next slide, that would be great. So um, just a little bit of an overview of the agenda for today's session. So as I said, we're gonna kick off um, and hear from Kate Sandal, who's our Director of Programmes and Engagement at B-Lab UK, who's gonna give us a bit of a context on, on the UK Climate Collective and, and what it is, and then also share some of our um, plans for COP26, which I think is one of the first times that we're actually sharing that with the community. So we're really excited about that. We're then going to hand over to uh, the co-chairs of our plastics and packaging working group, Mittal, Josie and Chris, and hear about some of their highlights over the last year and, and how the rest of the community can get involved in that working group. We're then going to hear from Fergus on regenerative agriculture, um, which we're really excited about what regenerative agriculture means and, and how you can get involved as well. And then last but not least, we're going to hear from Joe and Dave from the Circular Economy Working Group as well. Great, amazing. So we've got some some people still joining us. So if you just want to introduce yourselves in the chat um, and I will kick off. Great. So um, we're going to hear now from Kate Sandal, um, who's going to tell you all a little bit more about the Climate Collective in the UK and COP26. So over to you, Kate, and on to the next slide. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks, um, Catherine. Well, one of the big um, things that kind of drove, I suppose, our uh, the initial effort around uh, the Climate Collective was um, was COP, and it was COP25. So um, when it was going to be in Chile, um, we um, started mobilising our um, our B Corps to commit to net zero uh, by 2030, and we had 533 um, commit to it by COP25, which then happened in Madrid. Um, one of the reasons um, that we were able to kind of create that um, that strength and connection between the UNFCC and us was because Gonzalo Munoz um, was the high level champion for that year and representing from, from Chile. And he is still around and probably the, uh, the longest standing high level champion that's existed purely because it's had to be um, delayed by a year. Um, we have partnered with the um, UNFCC and the Race to Zero to um, encourage as many businesses as possible to commit um, to net zero and our mission is um, 2030. Now, um, there are many, many things happening with COP26. One is whether it's happening, uh, whether it's being delayed um, and how it's, how it's gonna take place. So a real reflection for us um, and our actions and our strategy around that is, is to bear that in mind. And what do we know that we can do and what do we not? And I'll go in a bit, um, bit more detail about that. But if anyone has any insider knowledge about whether it's happening or not, please do feel free to share either publicly in the chat or with us, we are. Um, we have our eyes and ears to the ground and we're talking to as many people as possible, um, but we still have no confirmation. Um, but one of the most important things I think is a reflection of, of us and what we're doing is um, this ambition around net zero. We know it's a, a, a primary um, engagement mechanism for, for the government and they are definitely focusing on net zero targets um, as we partner with the UNFCC and we know that they're also partnering with it. So really important reflection for us is net zero. Now, we know there are lots of challenges around this and the definition and what it means. I think it's really important to reflect on the fact that we need climate action, um, that yes, we need to question it. We need um, tangible uh, targets that are full of interim targets that maybe you know people are also reporting on annually. We probably need to think about what's the difference between offsetting and removal um, and recognizing that reduction needs to be the primary um, measure that most people need to be looking at. 
Um, but there's lots of things here. And what we want to encourage is really great stories of businesses who are willing to get uncomfortable, who are really willing to change and reflect on their strategy to be able to meet the challenges that we have ahead of us. And that's going to be absolutely um, vital. One of the things when Gonzalo kind of kicked off yesterday, and it would be great to know who else was in that session, was he talked about net zero actually being an interim target and net zero was on a journey to regenerative business. Um, and I think that's a really important reflection for us when we're thinking about who we are as businesses and what we're trying to, um, trying to achieve. And so um, moving on, Jess, to the, to the next slide. Great. Just talking about what that looks like from a UK perspective, I think is really important. So uh, we have 185 um, UK businesses that have committed to net zero by 2030. We want a lot more. Um, as Catherine gets very excited when she kind of updates, um, does our internal updates, talks about uh, how we've had so many more commitments and it's great. The challenge now we have is our community is growing at such a rate that actually the percentage of commitments <laughs> isn't necessarily growing up. So we really do need a massive concerted effort. And this is where we'd like to engage everyone and our climate collective around this. Um, so we have 32% of our UK community have um, committed and which is great, but obviously we want to uh, internally, we have a mission of supporting 100% um, of our businesses. So if you want to find out more, if you want to listen to, to kind of more information around net zero, there's lots of different ways to do that. So there's the UK Beehive group. And there is also um, a really great session that happened at the start of today that if you didn't listen to, we will be kind of um, uh, kind of chopping up and, and providing. It's a really incredible session, which has um, a lot of in-depth reflection on, on what do we mean around net zero, um, what scope three emissions can be looking like and what kind of targets and plans should include as well. So when we're thinking about centering equity and transparency in what we're doing. Um, and as I kind of touched on, the, the growth has been great. So we've got um, a growth of over 150% um, percent of our commitments since last year, but we just need more. So we need more businesses to take kind of tangible climate action that's rooted in um, removal and reduction or reduction and then removal um, and so I'll tell you a little bit more um, about the climate collective but I'll quickly just focus on our um, our initiative that we're planning for COP26 so recognizing that whether this happens or not um, the, the most important thing for us to do is to think about so Jess if you want to kind of advance the next slide um, is to is to focus on a campaign that we can center on that brings to life the recognition that we all have a big, big role to play. And the only way we're gonna meet the challenges ahead of us, if we start reimagining, if you want to go to the next slide, Jess, um, our boardrooms, our governance structures. And if we start um, talking about what things look like from a 2030 perspective, and that's a really important thing. So we are launching a campaign and we're launching it today. Um, and it's boardroom2030.org and I'll, I'll, I'll chuck it in the, the chat afterwards. Um, we're looking for businesses to register their interests, to understand whether they're willing to go on this journey with us. Are they willing to kind of reflect on who they are as businesses and see what would change if they're having these conversations of 2030? And I'll tell you a little bit more about what's involved um, in a second. But here, what we're trying to do is run something and do something that will be global that happens regardless of whether COP26 happens in November or not. So this is focusing activity, um, focusing thoughts and looking towards the future and that 2030, that all important target that we're thinking about and thinking about directors' responsibilities and government structures within businesses. Um, so if we go on to the next slide. What we're, what we're asking you to consider when we're talking about hosting a 2030 activation is the representation. So who is in the space? Who is part of that um, activation or that meeting? Do people that don't normally have um, a voice, are they there? Are you talking about youth? Are you talking about lived experience? Um, and what's on the agenda? So what are the topics that are relevant to, to a boardroom in 2030? Um, or how do you have a physical representation of something that you might be talking about? So maybe um, drought or floods or water becomes really relevant. So can you have a physical representation of water or you buy water when you're hosting that, when you're hosting that meeting? Or whether if you're in that last session thinking about um, kind of air pollution and air, you know, what does that mean? And then also including people from that lived experience who are suffering from that as well. So that's kind of one of those different ways of rethinking what we're thinking about when it comes to the environment and, and why we need to move forward. And one thing I, I haven't touched on here is 
on, on touch of kind of looking forward and being and reflecting on where businesses need to go to meet the challenges that we're going to face is also rooting all of this within climate justice um, and making sure this is a people centered approach to the actions that we take and recognize that we we're not going to get anywhere if we don't bring everyone with us so how do we include people and people who are normally excluded from these conversations in this and so the kind of the third iteration we're thinking about is decision making so um do we not use the normal voting powers that we have or are there different ways of thinking about this or are there um devolved powers that you could sit to someone else or is it the role of the youth board to kind of um dip forward and looking at this um and then also just one of the things I touched on, which is where is this taking place? So is it taking place in your normal boardroom or is it in a in a forest by the sea? Uh, is it, you know, in a different in your canteen of your office instead of in a boardroom? You know, what does it really look like to think um, like a business that's set in 2013? So if we move on to the next stage, we recognize that um, not every business has a board um, or that uh, the boardrooms are already board meetings is that so far in advance and we really want this to happen I took a little bit more out timelines in the run up to, to when we think COP26 is going to happen in November um, and so the, we think there's kind of four different ways that you can add this onto your um, to your to your meeting so one is pivot the current agenda that you have for your meeting which will be really important the second is an extension so maybe you add on 30 minutes to your existing board meeting um, to think about um, the topics that we've kind of discussed or that you think will be relevant. Third is why didn't hosting an away day to reflect on what that looks like um, and building out a bigger agenda around kind of a, a focus for 2030 and including those people that wouldn't normally be included or the reinvention. So what about actually if it's not a board, actually if your governance structure is totally different, um, who should be there? Is this a way to kind of bring employees onto kind of a decision-making platform and engage them in that way? There's, there's lots of different ways. So the website goes into a little bit more detail about what that can look like. Um, and then if we move on just to the next um, slide, brilliant, so the timeline. And um, so this is something that we're soft launching and we really want as many conversations to take place in the run up to COP26. And the challenge here is that um, we know October, November are going to be really busy. That's when we want the bulk of the conversations to happen. But we're also looking for early adopters, for, for uh, businesses who are willing to kind of jump on and run this and capture it. So we're launching a starter kit um, kind of around August. And we want businesses who are really keen and up for it to kind of go forward. We're having really positive conversations and lots of different businesses. Um, and we would love to kind of take that forward and think about who, who are going to be the ones to kind of trial this. And then what does, it, what does this look like in the future? Is this something that becomes part of your boardroom activations or not? So really up for looking um, at that as well. And then just to kind of touch on the on the climate collective and, and, and kind of where we started in, in COP25, where we're going with COP26 and the role that we think is really important with the B Corp community. And that's to, to, to show leadership, but also to encourage um, sharing of best practice and for businesses to move further faster because we know that we're running out of time or um, if you listen to kind of amidst yesterday and if you didn't um, really interesting uh, climate activist from the Philippines um, we've run out of time um, and the re reflection that we need to think there is how do we move um, further faster and I think that's really really important and so what we managed to do back in January 2019, when it was still okay to do to, has convened lots of people together for the launch of the Climate Collective. And what has come out of that is several different working groups, and we're going to hear from them today, which is very exciting. Um, and so I think probably I've spoken for long enough, um, Catherine, that I'll probably pass over to you to introduce the, uh, the working groups. Um, but if you have any questions, do drop them in the chat, and I will be um, happy to answer them. Amazing. Thanks for that, Kate. And I think we were actually exactly on time, which is brilliant. So um, we're now going to be handing over to the, the three co-chairs of our plastics and packaging working group, Mittal, Chris and Josie. So I'm quickly going to pin these um, speakers to your screen um, and, and hand over. So um, if we could just um, go to the next slide. Oh. I think we seem to have lost the slides there. Let's see if we can get them um, back up and I will just make sure you can see the speakers. Here we go, great, <laughs> brilliant, amazing. So I think I'm I'm handing over to Josie first. Um, so 
welcome Josie, Mittal and Chris, over to you guys. Thanks. Thank you and uh, a lot of pressure on us to keep on time <laughs> after Kate did so well with her timing. Um, so um, I can't see the next slide, but I, oh, there we go, I can now. Great, good timing. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I'm just gonna give you a really quick overview um, to start with and then pass over to Chris and then to Mittal. Um, my job is to give you an overview of the group um, our key issues that we're trying to solve um, and then also our core objectives to, to solve some of those issues. So one of the things that I think we're all aware of when it comes to sustainability is number one, it's not one size fits all and two, there's no silver bullet. So first and foremost, the biggest issue we've, we've faced and I think we could predict it, but we've seen it is um, the, the array of challenges when it comes to debates around materials and packaging, particularly around plastic versus other alternatives. Um, clearly plastic has, um, there is a big issue with plastic that we discuss quite, quite often in the group, but um, one of those um, challenges that come off it is, number one, how do you replace it? And number two, there are places that you can, you can obviously use plastic where it, it is something that needs to be, um, is the solution for that particular um, issue. So I think as a group, we're, we're kind of delving into how we address um, the materials and um, so many materials out there to assess that we're not replacing a material for something else that is, um, is worse. Um, it's understanding that, um, We've also got a responsibility of, as businesses to educate the consumer. So how do we do that? And, and how together as, as, as a group can we, can we achieve that? Um, and then also um, kind of making informed decisions. So again, how do we do that? So I'm from an overview point of view, Chris and Mattel will, will further on how we, how we do that. But kind of our core objectives um, around those issues and focusing on that is to, is to do an um, initial fact find around um, the options out there, around materials out there. Um, the way our group was structured or has been structured um, is to look at materials, particularly um, materials within packaging, obviously, and plastic, around uh, beginning of life, middle of life, and end of life of those materials. Um, and so initially our focus was really fact finding knowledge sharing within the group to really get a, a good overview and a good understanding of what is out there and what is being used and that brings us to knowledge sharing um, is um, how can we as a group harness that group mentality to share knowledge both internally but externally to um, the wider B Corp community um, and beyond and which leads me on nicely hopefully within a couple of minutes um, to Chris who's actually going to talk about one of the biggest outcomes which is Chris's Chris's brainchild um, is um, our matrix around materials and we're really excited about this one. So Chris, over to you. I hope I've kept within the time there. Hi everyone. Um, so um, one of the things that when we sat down at the beginning um, um, and sort of looked at the plastics and packaging group was that you're, you're a chair for a year. And what we wanted to do is we didn't want to have the same conversations going on every year and then not having any knowledge transfer. So um, what we've decided to do is we've looked at um, all three parts of um, the life cycle of um, you know, manufacturing um, in materials. And that's the, um, the beginning of life materials, um, the supply chain, uh, and then the end of life. Um, now, we've all got different choices depending on what sector you sit in. Um, a lot of the, um, you know, B Corps are um, in consumer goods, but then there's different types of um, you know, aspects of that, whether you've got short life, whether you've got long life, or whether you've got um, you know, uh, some, you know, different, different requirements for different products. So, and everyone's sort of plowing their own field individually. So what we want to try and do is trying to create a matrix diagram where you can score um, different aspects against your requirements and then you can create whether you're using plastic packaging or whether you're using glass or whether you're using tin or, or, or wool or paper or cardboard um, against the availability against the cost and you know it might not necessarily mean that you get the most perfect sustainable material every single time but what it's doing is putting you on a journey to ask the right questions about the materials that you are using you know what are the alternatives um, and what's the availability of those alternatives and you know across the, the beginning of life and then um, into the supply chain where you're using 
um, free, you're using pallets, you're using shrink wrap, and then to the end of life, whether you've got stuff that's getting picked up at the curbside or whether things have got to be um, you know, taken to larger stores or, or whether it goes into sort of general waste and, and trying to sort of you know, help people that are in the packaging space um, understand all the different aspects of things that they should be looking at and then give them these sort of options and choices. And that's what we've um, been putting together um, with the group so far. Um, um, yeah, we've created a scorecard, which we, which we hope is going to be um, very useful. And we, you know, we welcome to any of our B Corps that you know, um, are in packaging or, or, or manufactured goods of some description to, to, to share from the, the, the shared learnings from our group. Um, and that this is something that we will be able to pass on to the new chairs that um, go next year. And, and with that, um, I shall pass over to Mr. Al. Thank you, Chris and Josie. I think it was uh, wonderful to hear the whole, whole overview of our working and it's been six months now, I believe, halfway through already. And yes, uh, so how other B Corps in the community can get involved. So we've been uh, quite mindful and uh, we always introduce and get more and more members on board. So I think we started with 22 in December, I remember, and now we are 50 plus uh, in the group. And month on month, I think there is a lot of traction to the group. The reason, main reason behind is I think plastic and packaging, which is uh, everybody's talking about it. Uh, everybody wants to learn more and more and, uh, and, and strongly believe that it's, it's more about knowledge sharing uh, in the group, uh, which uh, happens quite frequent. And that helps all of us to address a lot of different issues, which we all face as a business and helps us understand more and more and grow and connect. And again, coming back to the matrix that has helped us so much in terms of, uh, we're not just talking about plastics here, but going well beyond plastic, paper, metal, and glass, which are the normal four materials usually talked about, but going beyond that and taking that extra effort and extra mile to serve more and more within the businesses. So I think that's, that's uh, very much what we believe in as a team. And again, it's all thanks to the fellow B Corps as well, which uh, we've has helped on month on month for us to attain and achieve these goals. And more or less, I would say that it's, it's more about knowledge sharing and exchanging ideas and perspective of what uh, the industry practice looks like at this stage and how we can better achieve in terms of government uh, initiations if we want to take as a team or leverage what existing knowledge we all have uh, because every business is different. Every business is facing different uh, challenges and issues, but at the same time, it's always good to hear each other that's what the end goal is and understand how we can learn from each other in terms of uh, best practices, in terms of certifications which we can achieve. And we've nicely done that in terms of uh, starting of life, uh, middle of life and end of life, which gives a clear perspective of the entire industry and be it any materials to do with any packaging, we can simply place into these three and figure out uh, that what we want to achieve. And it's end of the day, it's a pr producer responsibility. It's a climate crisis everybody is fighting for at this stage. And I think it's, it's a best platform for all of us to get together and get involved uh, at this time and make it happen, make it happen for good uh, and make this uh, planet a better place to live in. So that's the end goal for all of us and happy to uh, take this uh, aboard and uh, see what what more we can do in the next six months as well but uh, yes it's all uh, thank you to all of you guys uh, to make it happen and make it worthwhile as well thank you and uh, yes over to Catherine to take this forward thank you amazing thank you guys and I'm aware you you covered a lot in a very short space of time so I'm sure there will be a lot of questions I've got a lot of questions as well um at the end but thank you guys so much that was amazing brilliant I'm now going to hand over um, to Fergus, who is going to talk to us uh, a little bit more about our regenerative agriculture group. So uh, I'm just going to pin you on the screen, Fergus, and then over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Fergus Lyon from East Hall Farm, uh, a B Corp in, uh, in Hertfordshire, and uh, we're practicing regenerative agriculture but also very excited about the new uh, regenerative agriculture working group that's uh, just started. So if we go to the next slide, please. So this is a group that uh, uh, was just set up earlier this year. Um, here are some of the B Corp 
involved, but there's many others as well and uh, more growing uh, and more coming as well. So we're very keen to uh, uh, bring more people together to really understand what does it mean? Uh, what does regenerative agriculture actually mean for different types of businesses? Should we go to the next slide, please? So just uh, our interpretation of regenerative agriculture, it's a term that you're hearing more and more um, around, uh, around the world, but we see it as an approach to farming. It doesn't just sustain, but repairs, improves resources, ecosystems and uh, ecosystem services and communities. Uh, and for us at East Hall Farm, it's really important as well. It's, we see it, there's sort of five principles around regenerative agriculture. Uh, so firstly, it's about trying not to disturb the soil because there's so much life under the soil that as we grow our food, if we can do that without disturbing, uh, we have huge benefits in terms of sort of adding to the carbon uh, uh, um, capture in the soil and not releasing carbon uh, as well. We have the other principles about keeping the soil covered uh, having living roots in the soil, um, having diverse crops, and having grazing animals in the in the in a so in the system as well. Uh, so what we're looking at in regenerative agriculture is, is a real focus on uh, re not only reducing carbon but also capturing carbon. So really tying into the debates that we've been having about going beyond the uh, net zero uh, to actually uh, you know really great that people are thinking about the whole regenerative approach. And it doesn't really apply just to agriculture, it can apply to all types of businesses about how do we, how do we put more back in than we're taking out. Uh, the working uh, group as well is looking at this as an opportunity for collaboration all down the supply chain. Uh, it's holistic, inclusive approach, so bringing in all sorts of different uh, perspectives. But it's also something that's not clearly defined. Uh, it's more of a, an approach, it's a topic of that brings us together. Uh, uh, it's not, you know, we're saying it's not just a tick box, but it's a, it's a journey. So it's about being involved in that. Next slide, please. So in terms of our key issues that we're looking at in the working group, um, is agriculture is one of the biggest emitters, um, but we see as well that regenerative agriculture can have that rehabilitating role and enhancing the uh, entire ecosystem. Um, and uh, not only, yeah, as well as the capturing carbon as a huge benefit to biodiversity, also for water quality uh, and water use as well. So many environmental issues can, can be brought together. So because of the sort of interest in that from a number of us uh, in the working group, uh, the working group was brought together. And our objectives in the first stage is really to, on the one hand, because we've only just been going um, over the last six, seven months, eight months, uh, in so with our various meetings is first of all to have a sort of a definition of what we think of as regenerative agriculture um i think at the start we were thinking about yeah should there be a working definition but actually it's more the the general meanings of it that we're looking at as we kind of explore the different different approaches uh, uh secondly it's about raising the awareness amongst the b corp businesses involved so sharing experiences we're all bringing slightly different perspectives to the topic so it's really fascinating to hear that. And then also bringing in other speakers who, uh, and other people who are working in this space, who are it, maybe not B Corp themselves, but a part of the wider community, or maybe looking at going down that, that route. Um, we're sharing resources and expertise um, uh, across uh, you know, different platforms. Uh, and also uh, we had the objective to communicate with the B Lab standards team about regenerative agriculture in the BIA, which is, you know, what can we do to try and encourage more uh, uh, emphasis on regenerative agriculture, both by uh, those who might be practicing it directly, but particularly about those who might be feeding regenerative agriculture into their supply chains. Next slide, please. So the highlights, um, First of all, we feel it's quite good. We starting up any group is always uh, exciting. So we started in growing. We've had some great knowledge sharing sessions uh, where we've been hearing from different B Corps who have, uh, some of them have been exploring um, interesting talks from, for example, from uh, All Plants uh, who have a partnership now with regenerative farms uh, who are looking at how do they capture the carbon and the biodiversity benefits. Uh, and particularly partnering with uh, another organization called Soil Heroes, 
uh, who are looking to, to link uh, businesses with, with farms practicing regenerative agriculture. Last week actually was a, 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 a great uh, conference at the Groundswell event uh, where Ed Ayton, who you can see being accosted by the conference dog, uh, uh, talking there about the working group to this leading uh, conference and uh, agricultural uh, meeting uh, on, um, uh, on regenerative agriculture. Next slide. I think our most exciting thing happened when we had, we are very fortunate to have the Instagram takeover day uh, where we pulled together a range of different, uh, um, different material that came out through the day and uh, is uh, looking at whole issues around regenerative agriculture with short films uh, coming from a range of different people involved in the, in the working group. Uh, and just letting, acting as an important way of sharing information and it had great uh, power in this in reaching out to so many people uh, across, um, yeah, across, uh, across a huge area and a really powerful way to, to, to spread the message and to uh, raise more awareness and to bring more people into the working group as well. Thank you. I think that's, yeah, so finally, uh, ways that the B Corps can get involved. First of all, join the working group. It's open to all B Corp. Um, the other areas is all about how do you talk to your supply chain partners about regenerative agriculture. Uh, within regenerative agriculture, there's a whole range of other uh, yeah, approaches. I'd say that organic farming, you could say is a subset of regenerative agriculture, but it's all about how do we farm in a way that adds, um, you know, puts more back in. So organic farming, fair trade, uh, all these other elements can have uh, elements of this. It's a, it's a broader umbrella. But how do you talk to your, supp your supply chain partners about this? Then it's all about educating staff and customers um, about the topic as a consumer themselves. We all are consumers, so can we consume in a way that is slightly uh, looking more at uh, these sort of issues? And then finally, uh, can B Corp partner with regenerative farmers? Uh, like I mentioned, all, all plants. Um, there are ways of uh, working with regenerative farmers, both to encourage greater amount of uh, carbon capture, biodiversity benefits, water benefits. Uh, and there are various schemes of offsetting through agriculture, but there are sort of concerns that this is still in the early stage. But what can be really powerful is having that personal partnership uh, with farmers, so businesses and farms can work together, even if they're not part of their supply chain. But it allows that uh, uh, the ability to participate in uh, supporting uh, more sustainable food production, but also it acts as a partnership which gives a space, an outdoor space and being in touch with nature, getting businesses uh, and employees out into nature, which is so important, we found so important, particularly over the last year. I think that's all, thank you very much. Great, amazing. And again, we are perfectly to time in this session. That was exactly um, exactly the time there. Amazing. Thank you so much, Fergus. I'm sure people have got lots of questions. I can see some questions coming into the chat, which we'll get to um, at the end. So thank you. Great. We're now going to hand over to the Circular Economy Working Group. Um, so we're going to hear from Joe and Dave. So I am just uh, spotlighting you both here we go brilliant over to you guys oh, thank you very much that's great thanks very much Catherine and it was amazing just to hear um from the other working groups because a lot of the times we are kind of working in silos which um uh, it's lovely to see sort of some of the connections which is maybe for another day and another discussion um what we wanted to try and achieve with the circular economy working group is Again, it's leading on from um, the word regenerative and the circular economy um, will only happen if we adopt sustainable business practices. But that then means that we have to decouple from how we run businesses generally at the moment. So I don't know how many businesses there are in the UK. Let's say there's three million. OK, and we've got over 500 B Corps. But probably even a subset of that is maybe 50 real true circular businesses. 
So how do we get from the 50 closer to the 3 million? And really that's the kind of one of the objectives that we've been thinking about long and hard, I might add, at the Circular um, Economy Working Group, trying to engage to demonstrate to people that you don't need to go from one type of business model immediately into another. It is about progress. And actually the other two working groups that have, that have talked here today have given that. It's what I find remarkable about our community is that we are really happy in the grey where we don't necessarily have all of the information, but we really do want to have something actionable that comes out of there. Anyway, if you can move to the first slide, please. <laughs> That's lovely. Hopefully I've kind of covered this. So um, at the moment, most businesses are a linear economy business. You basically make something or you produce a service and eventually it ends up in landfill or somewhere where it shouldn't. Moving towards a circular economy is the recycling economy is something that everyone is kind of aware of. But when it comes to the circular economy, what we're really talking about here is we're talking about having finite resources and we are going to be 9 billion consumers worldwide. There just isn't, it doesn't matter how um, better we are at managing those resources. If we don't manage them in a circular fashion, then it really is game over. But it's not all negative, okay? We have demonstrated within the working group that there is ways to change and bridge the gap between maybe your current business model, which is a linear model, through to a, a more circular model. So how do we do that? And the way, if you go to the next slide, thanks, Catherine. This is one of the options here. So this actually came from QSA partners who are consultants that basically support businesses in how they can move their business models from the traditional linear model to a more circular approach. And when you think about products in particular, and if we take Beauty Kitchen, so Beauty Kitchen, what we do is we make beauty products, yeah? But traditionally, beauty products or any consumer products are in packaging that just gets disposed of. So what we have done to move to a more circular model is we have put our products in reusable packaging. So basically, you never own the packaging. You only own the shampoo or the conditioner or other products that are inside that packaging. And that's really moving from a very product based to a, from that to um, a product as a service model. And a lot of people would think that must be really difficult to do a product as a service model in consumer products. It's maybe easier to imagine that in a tech business, but actually it's just about breaking down each of the parts of your supply chain and focus it, having a laser focus in one key part. And what we did is we, we did it within packaging. Can you go to the next slide, please? So what QSA have created is they've created these seven C's of circularity and I'm not going to go through them all yet. What I wanted to do was I wanted to read from their blog one of the aspects that they talk about. So the customer is at the core of these seven C's of circularity, but the top one and, it, you know, really, this is probably where you need to start. This is your commercial case. Yeah. And you need to think about as a business, and that's what the working group are trying to do is, what is the best proposition to meet the market needs and the customer journey requirements? And then what operating model is necessary to deliver that proposition? And what is the detailed financial business case? So for example, if I use our example as a business, reusable packaging is five times more expensive than plastic packaging. OK, so how do how do we bring those two business models together? Well, the way that we do it is that this reusable packaging is a lease model. And that means that actually we can reduce the cost of that almost not quite. It's still a little bit more expensive, but almost the same as a piece of plastic packaging. So in the working group, what we're trying to do is is really, you know, bring to life what does the circular economy mean? 
because although there's lots of research out there, there's not really many people that are doing it in their business. So our working group is a bit more organic, and I'm sure Dave will agree with this when, when he talks about um, uh, you know, some of the, the key highlights. We're just trying to generate the interest to make it more engaging for all of the businesses out there that are interested in circularity. And I think the next slide might be passing over to Dave. Thanks, Joe. Um, I could listen to you for hours talk about this, so I really appreciate you and your motivation for, for change. And it's this sort of energy that we're going to need if we're going to make big differences here. So thank you, Joe. Um, yeah, so just to talk a little bit about the objectives, uh, as Joe touched on, it's an incredibly broad topic, the circular economy, and I think people get quite confused by it uh, in numerous different ways. So really for us, the first thing we wanted to do was to try and create some form of repository that had all of the information from the 18 members that we have, where our expertise lie, how we're using the circular economy, where we need help, what are the issues that we're facing and how we can help others. So the idea there was to really create an environment where we can look at each other's problems and help to solve them. And then if we can formulate that into something that works for the 18 members, we can then kind of expand that out. Um, so that's been working quite well. Um, there's certainly been lots of really interesting discussions that we've had. And I think we are starting at least amongst the group to really understand how we can push forward with the circular economy and also just ask for help and, and reach out and further define what it means for our businesses. So the rest of the sort of aims uh, for the year, we've we've kind of decided that we wanted to tap into our networks and contacts as well uh, and have regular webinars. We felt that you know introducing guest speakers would increase the engagement of the group uh, and most importantly, really start to share that knowledge uh, across the other UK B Corps. So the first part of that is being to sort of break down the focus areas in the circular economy. And we have like a list as long as your arm basically on all the different kind of points but the idea is to really you know take it to that granular level and then help everyone digest what these core principles are the circular economy and then they can integrate them into their own organizations so you know a, a, a few examples that i have on a list here you know designing specifically for the circular economy how you kind of roadmap roadmap that out for your business smart material choices, really drilling down like the plastics and packaging group are doing there into every little aspect, uh, regenerative thinking, uh, embedding the feedback mechanisms and really mapping out all of the, 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 the journey of those materials as well. So we're really hoping this makes it all more digestible, kind of demystifies what the circular economy is. But it's, you know, as Joe had mentioned, it's quite organic for us at the moment. And we're quite excited about where it's going to go. And where we were quite shocked that there wasn't a circular economy group before we created one in B Corp. So we very much invite you to, to come in and, and, and share any knowledge that you've got. And we'll be, you'll be welcome with open arms. So thank you for listening. Brilliant. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I think that was another perfect example of just how much is happening in the in the working groups and how many different B Corps are involved. Amazing. Um, we've now got about 15 minutes uh, for a, a Q&A. Um, and I think uh, there's been a few questions that have come into the chat. I think if we um, will stop sharing the screen now and we can start to kind of dive into some of these questions here. Um, so I think uh, I've got a I've actually got a question to, to kick off um, for the plastics and packaging working group. Um, and so I think what was really inspiring about your um, presentation was really about the the matrix and how even though you've got companies of different sizes and different industries that you can really collaborate together and work on on different initiatives. So I'd love to hear if there are any kind of if there is any scope for collaborative solutions or real kind of collaborations across the, the different B Corps in that, in that industry and a little bit more about um, how that kind of collaboration would work on, on solutions, that would be great. Um, I mean, I guess um, when we've been looking at um, stuff like the supply chain, um, 
um, and sort of uh, check pallets is something that, you know, that we are a group sort of talking about problems um, and then talking about solutions. And then we then say, well, one group would say, well, we use this solution. One, one's like check pallets, but there's been um, different things about other forms of transportation or, or products. And then uh, we then we then share that into the um, into the B lab as well. So um, it's a good example about how you know people are looking for solutions, and the other groups already figured out a solution, and it just makes um, many hands make light work. <laughs> Amazing. Just, just to add to that, I think one of the really interesting co comments was from I think it was um, it might be Lily's Kitchen potentially saying about when you're looking to use say new materials that are coming through or um, maybe materials that are um, kind of higher, a higher minimum order quantity, let's say, because of the nature of their manufacture, um, that perhaps there's a way that we can collaborate as a group and outside and as B Corps to kind of work together on those. So if, if for example, you know, a minimum order of a certain type of uh, really great compostable type of film was 20,000, you could maybe split it between three different B Corp groups. And I thought that was a really good suggestion, especially for those smaller businesses that maybe don't have access, want to do the right thing, but don't necessarily have the the reach or the volume at that point to do to to choose that material, and they're having to opt for something that's either you know cheaper for a, for a smaller volume, um, or allows them to have that minimum order quantity. Yeah, brilliant. That's that's amazing, Pierre. Thank you. Um, and I think we've had a few questions in the chat for, for Fergus about regenerative agriculture. And I think one here, I think that was where the conference dog <laughs> was mentioned from Nikki. Um, and so um, really interested in best practice guides that can be shared with suppliers um, and, and really around that kind of supplier code of conduct. And I hope conference dog is included in any and all best practice guides. Um, and so, yeah, it'd be, it'd be great to hear a little bit more about how um, your, your kind of best practice guides are working and anything around how to engage with your supply chain about um, regenerative agriculture would be would be really useful. And I think also, Fergus, my kind of follow on question was something that um, I've really been learning recently is how regenerative agriculture doesn't only apply to food businesses, which I think is what a lot of people think that it's actually kind of um, raw materials and, and fashion, for example. So yeah, I would love to hear a little bit more about what are, what are you most excited about around the opportunities of um, regenerative agriculture as well? Right, um, yeah, I mean, it's a good question about the supply chain. So we'll, I'll take that back to the group. And, uh, and if there's others, members of the group uh, on the call, then they should step in. Um, and there are sort of other guidelines. I mean, Unilever has uh, various guidelines and principles that they use, uh, um, which are a good starting point. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it might be something that we could uh, feed more in, uh, and, and that would be a great output out of the uh, out of the working group. Um, yeah, I can't guarantee about uh, conference dogs, but maybe all uh, all conferences should have a dog that uh, comes in and accosts the uh, speakers. But that's another. <laughs> that's not just for regenerative agriculture. Um, and then, sorry, your question. I've forgotten yeah. your question. The the last question was around the kind of opportunities and scale of regenerative agriculture and like what you're most excited about yeah i mean it's, it's, there's a lot of at our, uh, this big gathering of uh, all the sort of uh, people involved in it uh, uh, last week there was people there from the fashion industry as well so why can't we grow our own uh, materials uh, uh, as well at the moment so how can we uh, um, bring new markets as well uh, so there's a lot of exciting things there there's a huge potential market if we can crack the uh, carbon credit market in a way that's actually, uh, you know, going to be really um, uh, secure and full of assurances. Then I think that's going to be great. A little worried at the moment. There's uh, a few cowboys out there, and we've got to be careful on that. Uh, but that's where I think the, what I'd like to see in the B Corp movement is actually we can actually do something different. Uh, we can actually do stuff based on our own relationships and our own. Uh, sort of shared values and shared ethics to actually develop systems that then can be scaled up uh, more broadly on that. Uh, and it's not just carbon credits, it's also the biodiversity benefits and the water benefits. And you know, people are talking about carbon plus plus is kind of you know, going much more beyond the simple how much carbon is, uh, uh, is, is taken out. It's the, how we can link that to the ecological, tackling the ecological uh, crisis as well. Yeah, great. 
Thanks, thanks, Fergus. Um, and there's a, a question here um, for, for Joe and Dave about the circular economy. So Deepak has said, this is so interesting. We're a service-based business um, in design, but really want to encourage our supply chain to help us design in a more circular way. And I think, um, yeah, it was, it was really inspiring to hear from you, Joe. And I loved that you said, it's encouraging everyone to start thinking about how to be more circular kind of across all of the different industries. So if you kind of had, Maybe one one bit of advice for someone who's very inspired about the circular economy and and wants to kind of start taking those next steps around it. Where, what would what would you suggest? Yeah. So um, when you think of B Corp and your certification, one of the the reasons that we have got quite a, a good score is that we've actually gone down the cradle to cradle certification for our products. If you don't know anything about cradle to cradle, that's OK, because their website has so much information case studies, guidelines, you don't need to go through the certification to be able to access these questions that you can then ask your supply chain. Um, and really what Cradle to Cradle do is they help you design products and services that fit into the circular economy. And, and that's what's you know great because they'll show you similar to it's not similar to B Corp. Let me just be clear here. These complement each other because Cradle to Cradle is very much a design focus in safe and circular products and services. But what it does do is it gives you the questioning and the power to support those questions of your supply chain. And again, the other piece of advice would be it's saying to your supply chain, which is what we've done, this is not about a big stick. This is, I know there's going to be gaps. I want to know what those gaps are so that I can help you to close those gaps. So one of the things that we've done very recently as part of our um, net zero commitments is we're asking our supply chain about renewable energy, you know, scope two, and how can we get our supply chain to move to a renewable energy supplier? And obviously that comes at a cost at the moment, but the way that we've described it is we can lean in and support that. So there's ways of, of framing the questions so that people get engaged rather than go, oh no, I don't want to answer. Brilliant. Have you got anything yeah. to add? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would add to that is, um, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, ask questions of these suppliers that you work with and do some due diligence, you know. Um, you know, as Joe mentioned, there's, there's obviously, you know, you can say, you can frame it in the right way that you're not probing to cause a problem. You know, you're probing to, 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 to gain knowledge and information and to work together to, to, to try and do things better. Um, you know, it, it, at Reconomy, we're obviously dealing with electronics um, and everyone knows how, how poorly designed they are in terms of the circular economy. So we're, we're at the start of our journey, but we are dealing with many downstream partners who are, when we dismantle anything that's beyond economic repair, we're dealing with many downstream partners in metals or printed circuit boards, uh, we take things down to the raw materials as much as we can, but then we're constantly probing and finding new partners to provide better chain of custody, basically, and better documentation on what they're doing with it. And this is the only way that we're going to get anywhere if, if we're not afraid to communicate, not afraid to do that due diligence and ask questions. It's fine. It's OK. Fail fast. <laughs> Amazing. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And um, I'm just going to see if we've had any other questions in the chat. We've got about five minutes left. So if anyone does have any any questions, pop pop them in the chat here. Um, I think we've got a question from Jess. Um, if you wanted to unmute yourself, Jess, and ask your question, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, so I, it's incredibly exciting to see what you guys have been producing in these working groups. And I kind of have a question to the, the Secular Economy Working Group. Um, I sort of, I think a lot of the well, I'm, I'm nowhere near as familiar with that as you guys are, but um, a lot of the uh, work I've seen in the circular economy um, maybe doesn't fully consider the role of like producing, pr traditionally producing countries within like a more circular model. Um, and I just wonder what your thoughts are on sort of where lower GDP traditionally kind of producing economies in a linear model might fit into a circular model. I'd just be interested to hear if you had any thoughts on that. 
So I can pick up maybe the first part of that. So um, a lot of the ingredients that we get are direct from smaller farm producers that generally are in the Southern Hemisphere. And what we try to do is support them in terms of how they can fit into our circular model. However, what we find is that actually suppliers that are in lower GDP countries generally have better circular practices than we have in, in the Northern Hemisphere because they don't want to waste anything. And, and this is where the circular economy, I mean, it's not just about waste, but we, you know, we're, we, we are quite wasteful in the Northern Hemisphere because things are cheap, disposable and easy to access. When you get into these other countries, you would be slightly, I'm slightly ashamed sometimes of how amazing what they do. It just maybe doesn't have the organic certification or fair trade certification, but what they're doing is still very circular. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, this is a, a fantastic question, really, and a very difficult one to answer. And I think it's up to all of us, um, you know, in the Western Hemisphere to be, um, you know, very cognizant of this because we need to encourage uh, the knowledge sharing from from these these countries who are kind of starting off on a bit of a blank canvas as well. They're able to change and they're able to to look at things very differently uh, than what we are in somewhere like the UK, where things are very ingrained and often wrapped around bad legislation, um, you know, or bad chain of custody. So um, that's the only thing I can really offer is that. I think it would be great for B Corp as well to try and encourage um, to the extraction of, of that knowledge from from countries that are maybe way less represented in the in the global community for B Corp. Thank you. I think um, actually just anecdotally, Chatham House are doing really interesting work on like circular economy and climate justice. Actually, if anyone is interested in reading any more about it. Great. Amazing. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think there are any other questions that have come through in the chat, but I'm sure everyone has got lots of food, food for thought. And, uh, and now you're all going to rush to the Beehive, hopefully join each of the working groups, groups on the Beehive and get more involved in, in some of those conversations as well. Um, and we'll be sharing um, the slides after this session and we'll also be sharing um, the website and more about how to get involved in our Boardroom 2030 activations and, and some of those conversations ahead of COP26 as well. But thank you everyone so much and thank you all all of our wonderful speakers who joined us. We had a, a, a big group on this call, but it was so amazing to hear from you all and, and hear about what you're all doing. Great, so um, we have one more session in day two of our, of our climate summit, which will be kicking off in 15 minutes at 3.45. Um, that session is all about how to measure your digital carbon footprint and is gonna be a real action oriented session. And we're gonna hopefully learn a, a lot um, in that session as well. I've just seen Chris has put on his panda hat <laughs> in the gallery view, which is amazing. But thank you so much, everyone. Um, we'll follow up with the slides and the recording and all the links but thank you all so much for all of the working groups it's been so great to hear everything you're doing thanks everyone <laughs>